So what's a sales budget? We're going over master budget. We talked master budget includes a sales budget. This is the first step in the chronological sequence. What is a sales budget? We're taking our estimated sales by our estimated unit price. There's two variables here, right? Because our selling price could change and our, and our sales quantity of sales can change. Um, so here, the example is we're a hockey stick company. They always choose the funniest companies for this stuff. And so we have budgeted sales, October, November, December, right? We, that's the quarter. Q4, our budgeted sales are 1,000, 800, 1,400, and here's our total. Where are we getting these budgeted numbers from? We're getting these budgeted numbers from either historical records or and some kind of future looking estimate. So price per unit, same thing with selling price per unit. We're thinking it's gonna stay stable at $60, right? And so then we multiply that out and this is our expected, these are expected sales for quarter, $192,000. So that's, that's it. That's our selling budget. It could be a lot more complex if we have more different product types. But if we're just the hockey stick department, that's our selling budget. It should be easy. If I give you a test question on selling budget, you, you should be able to answer that one relatively easily. Just budgeted sales versus selling price. Um, and then we can calculate variances, right? Afterwards, we'll, we'll go into that. Then we make our production budget. Why are we making a production budget? Well, we need to make sure we actually have enough of these hockey sticks, right? We need 3,200 hockey sticks. We need to make sure we have enough and we don't want to store them too long in inventory because that would be expensive, right? We want to make them as close to delivery as possible. So units produced, our beginning inventory, plus our budgeted sales, less our ending finished in inventory. And then we might have a margin of safety. We wanna make, make sure that something gets stolen or if something goes wrong, we, we have enough. Or if, product, if sales increase, that we can meet that demand. So our production budget would look like this. So they're saying next month's budgeted sales. Sales, we have October, is November, right? We're looking at next month. We need to produce a month in advance. December and November, we need to make for December. And in December, they're saying it's 900. That would be a fact given to you that we need 900 in the next, the next month. Um, ratio of inventory. inventory. Uh, for future sales, we're saying 90%. Budgeted and then we take our budgeted sales, which of the current month, they in bold when there's math involved. Um, required units of available. So what we're saying here is we want to have 720 units, at least 90% of next month's inventory produced now. And we want to make sure we have enough of the current inventory for the current month. So 1,000 plus the next month to make sure we're comfortable. And then we want to deduct our beginning units. Ten. So this was just based off some written record. I guess we had 1,010 at the beginning and end of the last quarter. And then our 720 will be taking our budgeted ending, ending units and units to produce. That's going to be the difference. Now we know how many units we need to produce in order to meet our sales demands. But then the next step, if we're producing them, how do we get the direct materials for it, right? Note that these are in quantities, right? These aren't in dollars. Now we're going to go to dollars because we need to eventually think of a cash budget. So how do we do figure out the dollars for the direct materials budget? We take our budgeted production. 
is the 710. So each each one steps into the next one. You see why we kind of we have to go in this order: sales budget first, then production budget, then um, direct materials budget. We need enough materials to produce all these units. Requirement per unit. So this would be given to you. They're saying you need 0.5 of maybe like a four by four. Uh, so a half of a four by four to make the hockey stick, let's say. Materials needed. And then we always have beginning and ending inventory, or I guess this is pounds of wood. Um, and then I can double click this so I can see the wording. And budgeted inventory. Three thirty-five. That's given at the very beginning. Um, Two thirty-seven. Where are they getting the two thirty-seven from? Let me remember. Two thirty-five. Ending inventory here. Three thirty-five, two thirty-seven. Let's skip the next one. Total material requirements. Maybe the addition of these two. Six ninety. Let's see the two thirty-seven begin. Did I forget inventory? Let me make sure I remember where you're getting this from. Budgeted ending inventory in pounds. Maybe they have a note here. Sometimes they get tricky. From production budget. Two thirty five, two forty seven. Oh, are they saying the next one? Add budgeted. Oh, oh I see. We multiply this by five to get the materials needed. And then this will be given to you the budgeted ending inventory 237.5, 247.5. And then the total material requirements can be an addition of those two. And then we take the beginning inventory. And we deduct it. So we get that from the previous one. If it's not get it, at the beginning of the month, it'd be from the last quarter. They just don't have it here because we're just doing one quarter. So it's the reverse of this. Reverse of this. And then materials to be purchased. And we have our price per pound. The price per pound, the pound price in the marketplace. So they're saying 20 bucks per pound. And so then total price is this times the 20. And so that's our direct materials budget. So now we need to have all the materials. What are the other components of our construction? Our direct labor and overhead, right? Like labor budget, you just are trying to budget how many people are working. So just try to like take it back to basics is we're just trying to figure out how much materials we need for our budget, uh, for our production, how, which is meant for our sales and how much labor. And so we're saying, we know how many units need to be produced here. It's the same. It's always a budgeted production. And then labor hours needed, I think it's 0.25. Total direct labor hours right against each other. And then how much does it cost? Price. Twelve dollars in total cost of direct labor. Here's something interesting. Interesting observation. Anyone asks about like minimum wage stuff? 
right? Like I'm not trying to take a political stance here, but why do why is there like a debate about the minimum wage? It's because of this, right? Like if you increase the price of the minimum wage, it directly increased cost of good, right? Like that this is really an interesting observation. So because it directly increased the cost of good, it causes inflation. So whenever you raise a minimum wage, it increases the cost of production, which then increases what companies have to charge in order to make whatever profit. And so, um, or in order to make their, their goods profitable or stay in business, which is why we have like kind of a higher inflation. So interesting observation here. The direct labor budget is, is relatively simple, right? It's just, hey, how many hours do you need? This would always be given. And then factory overhead budget, you're just using your factory overhead rate. Factory budget. So most of this information will be given to you. It's just transferring the days, right? So we started with the production budget. You're going to have to make sure you figure out how many need to be produced. And then after you figure out what needs to be produced, then you kind of go down. And, and most of this will be given to you. You just have to be very careful in what you, how you place everything. And so again, we have our budgeted production. So if you got your budgeted production here wrong, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Um, in your cost accounting class, when you get there, you're probably going to have to make a very complex master budget by yourself. Or normally that would be like part of this class, but I'm not, it's a lot of extra homework. And I know you already have too much homework. Um, factory overhead rate. 250 would be given to you in this case. Total variable overhead. And what's the other component of overhead? It's our fixed overhead, right? We have variable and fixed. Fixed doesn't change. Equals fixed overhead is 1,500 a month. And we can figure out how much it costs for our factory overhead. Now we can figure out our product cost per unit, right? Why can we figure that out? Because we have our direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. So direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, fixed overhead. So we have half pound at measurement, dollar cost. Cost is 20, so it's $10 per unit for direct materials. It takes 0.25 hours at $12 an hour. Variable overhead is 2.5 per unit. That, that's an estimate made. And then we have 4,500 over 3,000 units of expected production. So 3,000 is coming here. So these, that's what all we're expecting production is. So our total cost per unit is $17. So this goes like, if anyone's curious why during coronavirus and the pandemic, why cost of things have gone, gone up, it's because direct material prices went up because of supply chain, which increased per unit costs, direct labor costs went up because people stopped working. So the people who were working got paid more. And then uh, as minimum wage also increased and then overhead, um, fixed overhead got allocated to fewer units, right? So if you increase this to 2000, your price goes up because you're you have less production. So you can see how like one thing in the supply chain leads to drastic increases overall um, in product, product costs. So everything's very finely tuned and balanced. Which is really interesting, right? Like this is these kind of budgeting things are much more important than you see at the face of it, and that's why it's useful having a professor that's or a teacher that's working in the marketplace, right? Like I'm not just an academic; like this stuff is actually applicable. It, it if you don't budget correctly, it you could increase the cost of all of society, right? It could lead to a huge issue. There's, there's a like social protection here um, by doing your job well. So cost of goods sold budget. So now that we know our costs, we need to figure out cost of goods sold. We know it's $17 per unit. So we take our budgeted sales. 
multiplied by our product cost per unit, get our budgeted cogs. Remember, this is on an absorption costing basis. How do we know it's absorption costing? Because we include the fixed overhead into the cost per unit. So our budgeted sales are going to be a total of 3,200. So we can say units, cost per unit. Cost per unit is 17, uh, or sales per unit. Seventeen. Our price per unit is sixty. So we know our sales are going to be nine. That our cost per unit is this, so we can figure out this is our cost of goods sold, sales, cost of goods sold, and this is our margin, right? The difference on um, grocery costing basis. So we make $43 per unit of profit margin and our cost of goods sold is going to be 54,400. But that doesn't include our selling expense. So now we need to figure out a selling expense budget before we can figure out the rest of our income statement. Right. So budgeted sales again. Budgeted sales are sixty thousand dollars, eight thousand, and for eighty-four thousand. And our salespeople get a ten percent commission. And then we also have a sales manager, a fixed salary in this department, pretty low salary, unfortunately, for this guy. And then what's our total selling expense? Two together, eight thousand, six thousand eight hundred and ten thousand four hundred. That's our sum. Let's sum this together. We get our total selling expense of twenty five thousand two hundred for the quarter, and then we can continue to build our income statement. Right now, we take that out of our. Um, we take that out of our gross profit. We we take out our selling and marketing, and then we get an income before taxes, right? Um, but we also have administrative expenses here, which we didn't consider. So we're saying we also have what's generally our administrative expenses, probably our accountants and lawyer, lawyers, right? So, and they're getting their, their $4,500 salaries. That's just going to be a salary. They're generally fixed, right? Administrative people are on a fixed cost basis. And then we need our capital expenses as well in order to figure out, um, our depreciation expense and whatnot for the forecasted income statement. So we're not throwing away anything, but we're gonna have to buy $25,000 in cash of additional equipment. Since it's the only one, we don't need a separate budget, but we'll need to consider it in our cash flows. And so let's prepare, prepare a cash budget now. The general for formula for a cash budget, we take all this stuff into consideration and we need to know what our beginning cash is, plus whatever we expect to get, our cash receipts, less our cash payments, and then we get preliminary cash balance, and then we repay loans. We have loan repayment activity. Like we have to pay back our debts, or we might increase our debts if we are gonna run short. So what's our cash receipts from sales? Remember, sometimes we get our sales are on credit. So we're saying here that we're gonna take a 40% cash receipt from sales, and the remaining 60% our credit sales that are collected in the full of the, prior, the following month. So we'll do our cash budgeted cash receipts from sales. Budgeted. We know our sales are up here. We had them uh, October, December. Um, they're also going to give you September here. I'll add that because you need to know how many sales happened in the last month in order to figure out how much you're collecting this month. Right? It's very similar to the AR 
accounts of receivable reserve concept that you learn in financial accounting, less accounts receivable, 60%. So we're figuring out for Q4, right? This all Q4. This Q3 number is just to figure out the Q4 collection. So this times point four, I think. thousand cash receipts we're saying that 60 percent of it's going to not be collected until the next month cash sales 40 percent of it is cash sales 40 percent of this 0.4 and then we collect 40 percent uh the 60 percent from the last month they are receipts little cash receipts this is actually quite simplified. Remember that do this over right automatically. Um, this is quite simplified. Remember the, the risk here is that sometimes customers don't pay. So normally we'd consider like a delinquent account amount as well. And sometimes customers don't pay in such a simplified fashion. Sometimes simple um, sometimes you're gonna have customers who pay three months late, four months late. So these cash receipt budgets can be rather complex. It's going to be the same as you like figuring out, well, you have paychecks, but you might also have some money coming from your family, but you also might be getting a tax refund and you're trying to figure out when to, you know, buy your car. Um, who would have thought budgeting could be so complex? And this is kind of a simple budget, right? So uh, I, I, I thank you for bearing with me as we walk through it. Cash payments for materials. Materials. So we need all the prior budgets to then figure out how much cash we have. Let's look at our schedule of cash payments for materials. So in our material purchases, that comes from our materials budget, right? 10,400 up here. There's our direct materials. From October. Our cash payments are going to be per month, purchase, prior month. So we're pretty much putting this on credit. So we're saying we're not going to pay for the current month. We're only going to pay for the prior month. And if we don't have the prior month information, it will be given to you. So just like customers can do with us, uh, we can and defer their payment. We can defer our payments. And that's kind of how we manage cash flow. Ultimate goal in business, one of one really important strategy is managing cash flow, right? Like um, you want to collect as quickly as possible and then defer payment as much as possible. So Trump gotten a lot of heat for that, right? Like if you ever uh, watched any of those reports, he like was kind of infamous for paying his contractors very, very late. Well, and that, you know, that is a business strategy. Like that's a total business strategy is to pay people as late as possible so you can manage your cash flow, but require payment as early as possible. Um, but, you know, ethics can come into that and all, all those other questions. Uh, generally though, like waiting 30 days or waiting 60 days to pay for something is generally a, a wise strategy if you can do it. And then expecting payment up front is also a wise strategy. One of my things I always tell my consulting clients is, like, let's look at your payment terms and make sure you're collecting as much as you possibly can up front. Don't wait 30 or 60 days to get paid. Um, okay. Preparing the cash budget. So now we need to know our beginning cash. We'll just jump to the actual budget itself here. What does this look like? This looks like a statement of cash flows, right? We're pretty much just making a statement of cash flows and projecting it into the future. So we're going to look at how much cash we have at the beginning. We add cash receipts, we have total cash available. So the beginning cash will be given to you, 20,000 bucks. 20,000. Um, and that should be the ending cash from our last period. Our cash receipts are the 49,200, right? We calculated that our cash receipts budget. 
And then our cash payments are going to be, oh, so total cash available is beginning cash plus cash receipts. And then less, less cash payments for direct materials, direct labor, factory, variable overhead, sales commissions, sales salaries, G&A, income tax payable, dividends, interest on notes. Purchase of equipment, total cash payments. All right, so we go through all of the different types of payments. Where do we get our direct materials from? Our direct materials comes from, it says 7,060. We've just calculated that. We have our direct labor, which is 2,130, which comes from our direct, direct labor budget, 2,130. Our variable overhead, which comes from our factory overhead budget. Uh, let's see. One, seven, seven, five. Our sales commission, which comes from our selling budget. Our fixed selling expenses, which comes from our selling budget. Our GNA, which comes with GNA budget. So g and budget, direct labor factory overhead, cost of good, budget of cash receipts. Oh, a bit of it at the bottom of the selling budget, I think. Administrative expense, or this 500. Income taxes payable, 22.3. Did we miss that one? Maybe that's coming up. We'll just say that's given. Oh, that's given for now, the $20,000 income tax payable. So we owe 20,000 from last quarter, generally pay our income taxes um, payable quarterly. And then we have a dividend payment, which would be given to us of 3,000. And then we have interest on loan from a bank. So that's information that'd be given, um, given to us is that, well, some of this cash is from a loan. And so we might have some interest for each month. So in October, I guess we have a 12% loan rate. And so we have $10,000 loan here times 0.01%, which is $100. And we have a purchase of equipment, which we mentioned earlier too, purchase of equipment, um, which happened, I think we're saying, so you can see all these different facts were given to us when we're gonna put the pay purchase of equipment and that we had, the, the question here is, if we don't have $20,000, we take a loan for it. At the beginning, we had $20,000 of cash payable for income tax, and we're gonna purchase $25,000 equipment in December. So December is our equipment. Let's see, where's the next place? Primary total cash payments, purchase of equipment at the bottom. So all these facts are going to be given to you. It's really just putting it all together, 25,000. So we can just copy all these formulas over to get our budgets. And purchase the equipment. We have the 25,000, our interest on notes. I'll walk through how to do this in one second. I just want to make sure we have all our other information. So we always have to be have a beginning cash balance of 20,000. Let's make sure we have, we don't have a purchase of equipment here. Our total cash payments, let's make sure we have this right. 43,000. 43,565. So we captured all the cash payments here correctly. Remember that the interest on the note was given. We had a $10,000 loan. All that information will be given to you. And we walk through how we calculate each one of these other steps, direct materials, direct labor, variable overhead, sales commission, sales salary, GNA, and income tax payable, and our interest on our note. Um, we have our beginning cash and our, that came from our prior quarter. 
And so we have our total cash payments. And so the question is, what is our ending balance? And so we have 43,500 and we're saying that our preliminary cash balance balance is going to be our total cash available minus our cash payments. So we have $25,635. We want an ending cash balance of 20,000. Right? That's what we're saying. We need to keep our business afloat. That's kind of our emergency fund. If you're just like thinking of an individual, it'd be your emergency fund. So loan balance, we started with $10,000 loan and we're going to use the remaining cash um, to pay off some of the loan, right? The idea is like, hey, we have extra cash left over. We have our emergency fund. So we just use extra cash to pay off the loan. Similar concept, you'll hear about people like trying to pay off their mortgage early. Generally, like they try to have an emergency fund and anything extra after saving for retirement and paying for their extra expenses, they normally try to pay off the mortgage early. Um, that's the whole concept here. So they're paying off towards their, um, towards their loan. But because their loan changes, your interest expense changes. So the interest on the note on this period is going to be $44 because it's 10% of the remaining loan balance or 0.1% of the remaining loan balance, 0.1. Right. So there's a 12% interest loan um, and we're just going to round out the interest. And so then we have total cash payments here. Uh, something's wrong here. Let me ten, four, eight, four, eight, two thousand four five hundred. Oh yeah, we don't have any more income tax payable. Yeah, thirty one thousand nine hundred. That was only once. The income tax payable was only once in this problem, and so then forty one thousand. We have the forty three thousand here. Preliminary cash balance is. These minus each other. Is that right? Sorry. Total cash payments 31. Preliminary cash balance should be. Oh, I forgot about our beginning cash. Our beginning cash is 20,000. So we have the 40,300. And then we take out, we only want 20,000. We only need 20,000 left, right? So we get us pay off the rest of our loan. So we can take this minus this, and that's our ending cash balance. And then we can carry that ending cash balance forward. And then we take that, we have $101,000 in preliminary cash, and then we can figure out, we have, this is the right amount, let's see, total cash payments, 25,000. Or 56575 because now that we have the extra cash and we paid off our loan, now we're going to buy a new piece of equipment. And then we take out our beginning cash minus our ending cash to get our new ending cash. And that's really the cash budget. So I know it was a lot that we're going through. I'm trying to go through it a good clip. I'll, I'll share this recording with you all. I see a chat. This isn't going to be on the midterm, right? This is going to be on the final. And I'm just going to ask you for one piece of it. But you are expected to know how to do these budgets, right? So it's going to be this complicated for your homework and quizzes. But for your midterm and final, I might just ask you to prepare one aspect of a cash budget. Or one aspect of, I might ask you to figure out the cost of goods sold budget, right? But I'm going to be giving you 50 questions and only three hours to do it generally. So, um, I, I obviously can't give you a full budget to do. A full budget should take you about an hour to do. Like we're doing it together now and I'm aware of this information and where to get it. So I, I, this would normally be like a final project if we were doing a project in this class. I expect you to spend like five to 10 hours on it. I'm not gonna do that for you on a midterm, obviously. I'll, I'll just have you solve for one, one portion of this. But I'm gonna make you do it on one of your homework assignments. Not a question. You need to know, under, understand, like none of this is complex math, but you have to be able to think logically of where all this information is going. But good question. So don't stress. Remember, this chapter is not on your midterm. We just need to do it because we have so few classes.
And then, so we thought cash flow statement was tough. Wait for the income state. We need to do income statement, balance sheet, and statement of equity. And we need to do it in that flow, right? We finished the cash flow budget. Now we need to do, but I mean, we finished the cash budget. Now we need to do budget income statement. This is very FP&A. So if you ever want to get into finance, this is pretty much what you're doing. Right, you're like forecasting the future. And you're trying to then make sure the company stays within those. You're either like focused on making sure sales stay there and controlling sales or making sure that you control costs. Budgeted income statement. What's our income statement? Our sales. Well, and we're just going to do it for the quarter end. Sales minus our cost of goods sold. Our gross profit, our margin, and then we take our operating expenses, which includes sales commission, salaries, A, interest, expense, account before income taxes, expense, and we have our net income, right? So let's see where we're getting all this information from. We're going to do it for the full quarter. So sales, we know where we got that from. It's very top, 192,000. Cost of goods sold, we got that from the cost of goods sold budget, 2,400. Our margin, our gross profit, 37,600. Our operating expenses, we know our sales commissions. That comes from our selling budget. Plus this, plus this, plus this. We know our sales salaries. We also, and we also know our G&A expense was a 4,500 three times. Our interest expense is the 144. Where are we getting that from? We're getting that from our cash budget, right? This plus this, it's rounding it. That's where you're getting 144 from. And so, our total expenses here, 38,834. The difference is our in, income before interest and taxes, I mean, income before taxes. And then we take our tax of 0.4%. That's where we get the $59,254. That's our budgeted income statement. We use that to make our budgeted balance sheet. Remember our flow income statement goes into retained earnings, which goes into the balance sheet, which then goes into our statement of cash flows. But we, we already kind of have a cash budget, so you don't need to worry about it. But so that balance budget sheet, we'll have cash. Let's go over our balance sheet assets equal liabilities plus equity. If anyone forgot about that, um, cash. Accounts receivable, raw materials inventory, goods inventory, equipment, accumulated depreciation, total assets, and then we have our liabilities and equity. AAP, income tax payable. And our stockholders equity is common stock. Earnings. That'd be our total liabilities equity. And so where are we getting our cash and in cash balance from? That's from our cash budget. Right here. 44, 706. Our accounts receivable is coming from our cash receipts budget. We know that we expect, I think it was 0.6 of this. Yeah. Our raw materials inventory, we get from our raw materials budget, 4,950. Let's see, total price. Where are they? Well, we have all the annotations down here. 247 of raw material, 
at twenty dollars per pound. Oh, that's nine hundred fifty. We have our finished goods inventory, which is thirteen seven seventy. Uh, that's coming from our I'm guessing our cost of goods sold budget, but we'll see here. Two ending finished good inventory at seventeen dollars per unit. Oh, yeah. So we have our production budget, right? Our production budget up here. Our let's see, budget ending inventory of. Eight ten times the seventeen dollars per unit per sort per cost of sales budget. That's our finished goods inventory. Our equipment of two twenty five thousand. That was a given to us. It was the two hundred thousand given to us plus our purchase. Up here, we we're told that we started with two hundred thousand and then we bought the twenty five thousand in December, and then. The depreciation would, was given to us in this say, this situation. Minus 40,500. And so this is our total assets. 2983. Our AP, that comes from our payment, right? The, our cash payments on materials. Remember, we don't pay it. We always pay a month ahead. And so the 9,700 we're going to pay next month, our income tax payable comes from our income statement, the 39,500. And then the common stock is given to us. And then the retained earnings is given to us. Well, the retained earnings is our net income plus what was ever given to us previously. So you can see that gives us our balance sheet. And they both tie. Remember, balance assets always equal liabilities plus equity. And so we're good to go. So what's the big takeaway from budgeting? Budgeting is important. Why is it important? Because without knowing for, forecasting our sales, if any one of these things is wrong, we could be off. And so what would we do as if we were finance managers of this business? Every end of the quarter or every end of the month, we'd see how close are we on track to every single cost and every single sale. And why, why might we be having variances? Is it because prices are changing? Is it because we're not selling enough? Is it because we're not producing enough? Is it because labor changed, labor price increased? You might have to make a labor schedule. Do we have enough employees? Are the employees working too much overtime? You will investigate every single one of these lines and then try to figure out the driving factors and what's controllable. That would be your job as a manager. And, um, and so the whole point of this is so we can make our business profitable, so we know where our selling point is to be to be profitable. And if like, let's say you're trying to start a new business, like let's say you're trying to be a founder of a business, you'd want to project something like this. Like I have founders come to me and say, can you make me a pro forma financial statement? That's what they're saying here. A pro forma financial statement is like a forward looking financial statement based on estimates. So I know where I have to get to make my, um, my break even analysis. So I can see how I can get to a place and I can, Get, show this to investors. Like if you want to be a founder of your company, you want to show this to investors and say, listen, I have a forecasted balance sheet and income statement and cash flow for the next year. And this, you can see exactly if you give me this money, what I project you to make in return. That, that's the whole concept of this. You know, there's some, you can also do this for service companies. All, the only thing is you get, don't have to worry about the production, right? You just have to worry about the direct labor and then everything else is the same. Um, there's some other complexities here that we don't have to cover. You can do this also using activity-based budgeting, and you could also do this for a merchandising company. Activity-based budgeting um, just means that we would base it off of the different types of services we're performing. It's better for a service company. So like if I was an audit firm or a CPA firm, I might be budgeting based off of like my auditing department, my tax reporting department, et cetera. Um, rather than based off of uh, the generally reported like gap gap subjects. Uh, so I had a question. Would it be sort of useless to make a pro forma um, income statement and during like economic um, like recessions and stuff? 
like basically in 2021 if someone made it it would probably be like very different to the estimated because like prices of uh, like lumber for example right if i'm a construction company they change rapidly and i can't really estimate that well that's a good question Saeed. and that is so I would challenge you if everyone here should be interested in some kind of company. If you're a business major, like there should be a company you're interested in. You can always listen to a public company's earnings calls, which is the CFO and the chief executives talking through exactly what we're doing here. They're talking through the changes of their financial statements and what went well, what didn't go well, and why they think it happened. And what you would have noticed in 2021 is pretty much all of them went and said, listen, we can't accurately do this right now. Yeah. Okay. So you don't make it basically if it's during like economic crisis. No, you still make it. You just say you do your you say you, you do your best, and there's like, hey, it could be widely off. Like okay. We don't know when this is gonna be fixed. We're gonna make yeah. our best estimates, but you kind of disclose to everyone. We know we could be really off on this, and we're gonna have to keep a very close eye. That's what okay. pretty much everyone said on their earnings calls. They had like a big. It's called a disclaimer, right? They All said, right. Okay. They said, hey, good. listen, this is crazy, <laughs> and we. we <laughs> We don't know what the prices will be in the next month. We don't know what's going to happen with labor or anything, um, but we're going to keep doing our best. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Just because there's uncertainty doesn't mean you shouldn't try to plan for it. Right. But I think of it, think of it this way, like um, a, a national disaster or of some kind always happens almost like every 10 years, every 10 to 12 years. Yeah. And it's not national thing. It's like personal disasters. Like someone in your family gets sick, you get sick. Um, that doesn't mean you stop your plans, right? Like just if I got sick you or just do it. Oh, okay. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you just try to do your best and like accommodate as it comes along. Right. And try to have, maybe have some cash in the bank for emergencies. That's what that emergency fund is here. And I'd say it's personally, you always want to have a little cash in the bank in case you lose your job or something like that happens. You can't predict the future always. And the best thing to do is have a little insurance. Um, the last piece here is like, we can do it for merchandising company. You just take out all the crazy production aspects and you just look at it from um, a purchasing perspective. So something that a lot of students ask me, like um, what kind of businesses do I recommend to start off with? I recommend reselling or, or uh, services. Like if you're trying to go into producing items or working with a production company, it gets really complex. And even reselling can be complex. Service is a very nice place to start because it's already kind of a complex business to understand. But once you start having like supply chains and then have to worry about production, it, it can get really hard to, you have to be really meticulous in tracking your, your budget. It can be a full-time job just doing that. Or else you're like missing opportunity. Um, so that's chapter seven, that's budgeting. I know it's a lot, but it's a, just simple. It's a lot of simple equations and you're just kind of stacking your knowledge on top of each other. And your classes will continue like this in finance and accounting, right? Like now we know budgeting, then you're gonna learn how to do budgeting analysis, like forecasting and comparisons. And you're gonna, your budgets are gonna get more complex. Like what happens if you acquire another company and how do you take into consideration combining their budget with this budget? Like you start learning more interesting factors or how to value companies based off their future budgets using like net present value considerations. So all these are building blocks. Um, like I said before, I'm not going to be testing you this on this, this midterm. And I wouldn't, uh, I would just be focused on this for your homework. So I'll upload this full video for this class and you can just like kind of reference it back to it if you're getting confused where any of these numbers come from. Hopefully that'll be helpful. And remember you, you'll be able to use this on your midterm and final, this Google Sheet. I'll stop recording.